lot of you here. Hi. So I want to talk about uh, talk about trust. I want to talk about trust in society. Uh, and so well, this morning I woke up in my my hotel, uh, trusting I guess a lot of people who had the key to my room. Uh, went downstairs, had breakfast, trusting I guess both the cooks and the servers and everyone who prepared the food. Everyone who grew it, I mean the whole chain. Uh, got into a taxi cab, which is a huge uh, example of trust here, here, in, here in Paris, trusting not only the driver, and, and, but, but everybody else on the road. Uh, got here, right, there are you know, hundreds of you here, you're all strangers to me. Uh, right, and that was what, before 11 o'clock this morning. And the point I want to make is, is that trust, is that trust is, is really essential to society. That Society doesn't work without trust. I mean, look at us here. We're all sitting in this room, right? And, and pretty much all strangers. And, and not one of us has jumped up and attacked the person sitting next to them. Right? You laugh, but if we were a room full of chimpanzees, we couldn't get away with this. Right? Human beings are the only species that could do this. Right? We're the only species that trusts at this level. And we trust perfect strangers thousands of times a day. And the fact that we just pretty much never even think about it is a measure of how good that trust is, of how well that trust works. So what I want to do is, is I want to start thinking about it. I want to talk about trust in society, how trust works in society, and how we enable trust. It's, I think it's an interesting way of thinking about society and an interesting way of thinking about society's problems and how we might solve them. Uh, a lot of this comes from my latest book, Liars and Outliers, which I've been told some of you have, that they, you had an opportunity to, to take a, a set of books here at this conference, and some of you took that book, in which I, you did. I thank you. Uh, really, you know, I'm a security person, so I think of everything in terms of security. And really, what I'm talking about is how security enables trust. I mean, there's a, lot, there's a lot written about the value of trust in society. There's a lot of political science literature on uh, high trust societies and how they work, and the cost of low trust societies, how trust enables both business and personal interactions, how things are better if you can live in a society where, for example, you can just trust the taxi drivers and how, how things are worse if, if you can't. That, that's, less of, that's less what I want to talk about. More I'm interested in how we induce it, right? how we as society enable trust. Really, it's a talk about self-interest versus group interest and how the group enables its interest, or, or in another way, how the group enables its norms. There's a lot of different words I can use here. All right, so trust is a very complicated concept. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different meanings of the word trust. So there's, there's a personal and intimate form of trust. So when I say I, I trust a friend, what I'm really talking about, is, it's less about their specific actions and more about who they are as a person. Right? I, when I say I trust a friend, I'm saying I know who they are I know their intentions, I know their beliefs, and I trust that their actions will be informed by those beliefs. It's a very personal thing. That didn't happen in the taxi this morning. Right? I had no idea who the taxi driver was. For all I know, he could be a bank robber at night. But I didn't actually care. All I cared is that he would take me from my hotel to here and not overcharge me. You know, and he also trusted me that I would sit in the taxi and not, I don't know, throw up in the back seat. And, and when I got here, I would pay the appropriate fare. Right? So we trusted each other in the confines of that interaction. Right? So I, I, I don't know the cab driver's intentions, but I am really trusting his future actions. And I'm trusting that he will behave in some manner. Right? So I might not know whether someone wants to steal, I just know he won't. You know, so maybe this form of trust is, is, is more confidence. 
and maybe the corresponding trustworthiness is compliance. In another way, I'm reducing trust to consistency or predictability. Uh, the term I like to use when someone is trustworthy in this manner is that they're cooperative. Uh, the taxi driver was cooperative in this, this system of taxi driver passenger, just as I was cooperative in that same system. So in today's society, we trust people, companies, and systems. I mean, if you think about it, it's less that I trusted the taxi driver and more that I trusted the Parisian taxi system that produced him. Or, or a better example, and I, I flew here yesterday. Right? And in flying here, I trusted the pilot. The pilot would get me here safely. But actually, I didn't. I never met him. I never saw him. What I trusted is that Delta Airlines has this system of producing well-trained and well-rested pilots in cockpits on schedule and will get me to my destination. And I'm trusting that the company handles the details, and all I have to do is show up. And in fact, I did, and here I am. It worked just fine. Also, when I landed, I, I went to a, an ATM machine, put my card in the slot, pushed a bunch of buttons, and trusted that some vague international banking system will debit the proper amount, probably minus some exorbitant exchange fee, right, from my account back in the United States and, and give me euros here. And I mean, I, I actually didn't check. I didn't go online and check. I assume it worked. And just, just as we all do. So this trust is complicated, right? It's not, it's not binary. It's not I trust or I don't trust. You're trusting someone to drive me to this, to, to this bourse is not the same as trusting someone to you know, babysit my children or to go into business with me or to lend them $10. And so I mean, there are a lot of different types of trust. So that's, that's what I'm thinking about in trust. All right, so all complex ecosystems require cooperation. Right? Any complex system, like the system of people sitting in this room, requires cooperation. We all have to, I mean, we know what's going on here. You all sit quietly and I talk. Right? We're in a different room. You know, in an hour, we're going to go upstairs and have lunch. And it'll be, a, uh, it'll be another room, but a very different set of protocols. The protocol will be we all talk quietly amongst ourselves. So we all have to cooperate. All complex systems require cooperation. This is true for biological systems. This is true for social systems. And this is true for socio-technical systems. And, and this is where it gets interesting, in any cooperative system, there is an alternative parasitic strategy. And this could be a tapeworm in your digestive tract. This could be a pickpocket at the lunch upstairs. This could be spam and email. This could be people who don't pay their taxes. I mean, whatever. In any system, there is a way to subvert the system for personal gain. And I'm going to call the people who do that defectors. And if you know any game theory at all, you're going to recognize cooperators and defectors. Those are the terminologies used in the prisoner's dilemma. Prisoner's dilemma is, I think, a really good thought experiment at looking at the dynamics of cooperation, looking at this tension between self-interest and group interest. Uh, there's a lot of, I'm not going to go into the details. There's a lot of examples of it everywhere. I think it's a really nice way of framing the kinds of things I've been talking about. And I've, I've urged if anybody's interested, Wikipedia is a great place to start and just move from there. And you can see a lot of ways that this dilemma frames what it is I'm talking about. So back to these parasites, these defectors. Now, in any one of these systems, parasites can only survive if they're not too effective. And this is important. If if you're a parasite, if you're a tapeworm in someone's digestive tract and you get too greedy, the person dies and you die. 
Right? If there are too many pickpockets upstairs, no one's going to come back to this event. Right? The event dies. Too much spam in email, people stop reading email. No one reads the spam. Too many people don't pay their taxes, you get grease. So there's this, this fundamental tension between cooperating and defecting. Right? You, know, it, it's, you, you can't have only one thing. It, it's interesting. It, it's a tension between us as individuals and us as society. So think, so think of it this way. Right? You know, we might individually be better off if we steal, but we are collectively better off if no one steals. Right? We might be individually better off if we don't pay our taxes, but as a group, as a country, we are better off if everyone pays their taxes. Right? That's the tension. And actually, it's, it's, it's more interesting than that. It's actually, we're better off if everyone cooperates but us. Right? So it's good if I get to steal. It's better if I live in a society where no one steals. But it's even better if I live in a society where no one steals and I get to steal. Right? I get all the benefits of living in a theft-free society, and I get your stuff. But if everyone does that, society collapses. Right? Society doesn't work if everybody steals. Now, most of us realize that. Right? Most of us realize that it's not in our long-term best interest to act in our short-term self-interest. Not everyone does. That's why we have security. I mean, that fundamentally is why security exists. You can think of it as a tax on the honest. Right? Security is the extra cost that we all have to pay because some of us try to cheat. Right? So at this conference, there is some security. You're all wearing badges. There are people around who are checking badges. Right? That's there because if you didn't have that, some of us would not pay and sneak in. Right? That's the risk. The cost is the added security. That cost is folded into the cost of this conference. It is a tax we are paying. If we were all honest, if no one would ever try to sneak in, you wouldn't need the security. The event would cost less. And you could, all securities like that, you could look at it as a tax. So the way you can explain this cooperator defector tension is, is through evolutionary biology. And this is, was really nicely done by E.O. Wilson in his latest book. Right? But you think about you know, normal evolution works on reproductive pressure. Right? So if your genes make you more, so actually if your genes make your children more survivable, your genes are more likely to be passed on, they're more likely to survive. Right? That's the selfish gene. That, that forces you to compete with everyone else around you. Right? Your, your evolutionary fitness is competing with everybody else for reproductive success. The more reproductive success, the better you do, the better the species does, the better your genes move on. But in any social species, there is another type of pressure. Because in a social species, you not only have individual fitness, you have group fitness. Right, so groups of individuals live and die together. So if the troop, the tribe, the family group, right, if they can survive, they will do better. So there is another evolutionary pressure towards cooperation, that cooperating with your group is also beneficial, which means in any social species, like, like humans, there's going to be a balance between cooperating, group interest, and defecting self-interest. And this has been modeled pretty extensively. There's a lot of good work done in, in, uh, in computational biology. The, there is no uh, single strategy that any, uh, that any good strategy is going to be mixed, somewhere between cooperating and defecting. And then that's basically what we see. And security becomes the mechanism by which the group uses to keep the amount of defection down to some acceptable minimum. 
right? That, that's the mechanisms that we use to keep ourselves cooperating because cooperating is essential for survival. And note I said acceptable minimum and not zero, right? The goal is never zero defection. It's always some small amount. Right? There probably is someone here who snuck into the conference. But you know, if it's one person, we don't care. Right? If it's all of you, that's a problem. So that's the mechanism, right? I mean, I mean security is how we induce cooperation, right? Cooperation induces people to be trustworthy. Trustworthy enables people to trust, and that's how we make society work. Right? That's the mechanism. Now, now notice here, that this is important, that I'm not making any claims about the moral stance of either society or the defectors. I mean, I'm really just talking about how society enforces its group norms. You can easily imagine a society with immoral norms, immoral from some, from some moral stance. Right? I don't know, a slave-holding society. I mean, you can ima easily imagine a society where the defectors are in the, in the right. I mean, right now in the United States, we have a very famous defector, a uh, you know, NSA contractor, who has published a lot of, of, of documents, classified documents. And in the US, there's a debate about whether he was moral or not. And you can have an opinion on that debate, but he was defecting from the group norm, which was we do not expose classified documents. There are like something like 7 million people with a, a top secret clearance in the United States, and he's the only one who did that. Well, I guess one of a few. Right? So he is, in the terms, a defector, even though we might consider him a moral actor. I mean, I'm really looking at the, how groups enforce their norms. You can imagine a group being a criminal organization. In the same way, we'll enforce a bunch of norms. The norm might be, you know, we do not inform, on to, we'll inform about each other to the police. Right? And, and security mechanisms will keep criminals in line with this norm. So when I think about the different ways, the different mechanisms we use to enforce these norms, the term I use is societal pressure. And I like the term because pressure implies a force. And this really is. These are the forces we use to keep people conforming to the group norms, keep people from defecting. And I have four basic types of uh, societal pressures. Uh, the first one is morals. And, and by morals, I mean a very general term for anything that happens inside our heads. Right? So but one of the things I said is that, that a lot of this comes from us being a social species. So a lot of these societal pressures come from inside our heads. Because in that, that's where they work. Now, you know, most of us don't steal, not because we'll be arrested if we do, but because we know it's wrong. So by morals, I mean uh, feelings of guilt and shame, feelings of uh, honesty and fairness, wanting to belong to the group, deference to authority. There's a whole lot of stuff here that I'm kind of lumping into morals. Uh, it's a combination of stuff that's innate, comes from our own heads, stuff that comes from our community that we learn. And they all largely you know, keep us cooperative. Uh, the second kind of societal pressure is, is very similar but, but different. It also comes from in our heads, but has to do with, with other people. And I call it reputation. Right? So reputation is how we behave because of how others would react to us. Right. And, and you sort of know how this works. We get praised for good behavior. We get snubbed for bad behavior. In extreme cases, we get ostracized for bad behavior. Right. If a friend comes over to my house and steals my sweater, I'm not going to call the police. I'm just not going to invite him over anymore. Right. And that kind of societal pressure does a lot to keep us in line. I mean, you know, if it was just morals, one of you might, you know, jump up right now and start singing. But if you did that, we'd all look at you funny. And nobody wants to be looked at funny. And this is real important. 
right? You know, as, as a social species, we are very concerned about reputation, both others, and there are a lot of interesting theories of the development of language that it, it would develop and an ability to deal in reputation. Because right? if you think about it, humans are very unique here. I mean, other, other species deal in reputation. Uh, primates do, uh, some corvads, uh, bats, that they will recognize individuals and react according to the history. Right? That's reputation. But we're the only species that can transfer reputation information. Right? I can tell you about him. Right? That's an enormous deal. Right? That makes like Yelp possible. Right? That we can tell each other information about other people. And we are very sensitive to this. Right? The definition of gossip, information about other people. And there's one experiment I just want, I just want to talk about to, uh, to illustrate this. This is... This was done at a, uh, in a psych department. And it had to do with a coffee machine and an honesty box. And the way the, way the, the, way the coffee machine works is a coffee machine, coffee pot sitting in an open area. And there was a box. And, and the, you, when you took a cup of coffee, you put a coin in the box. Like, that's the way the system worked. Nobody was watching. It was purely based on, on, on morals. But it, it was a really nice experiment because you can accurately measure compliance. Right, you measure the amount of coffee drunk, you count the money in the box, you know exactly how many people cheated. So what the experimenters did, and this is just a great idea, is, is they put a photograph of a pair of eyes behind the box. And they found that this increased payment significantly. Right, just being reminded that someone might be watching is enough to make people more honest. I mean, no one's done this like at a banking website, but if it worked, it'd be the cheapest security measure ever in the history of the planet. But that just is a flavor of how important it is, how important it is to us how we are perceived, right? what our reputation is. So those, these two societal pressures, morals and reputation, are very old. Right? I mean, they're, they're, they're as old as our species. They're even older. And I think of them as our societal, primitive, primitive societal pressure toolkit. Right? This is all that kept us cooperating for a couple of hundred thousand years. The problem with them, well, I mean, the, problem, the problems are obvious. One is they, they're pretty fragile. Right? They can break. You can ignore them. And two, and this is more subtle, they don't scale very well. There kind of is a maximum group size in which they work. And for reasons I'll spare you, that number is, tends to be about 150. You get more people than that in a group, and, and suddenly you have a lot more defection. And you think about your family, your household. That's enough. Morals and reputation pretty much keep everybody in line. But that's what? Five people, six people. You get to your extended family, you know, bigger social groups. It gets a little harder. You start getting large, and suddenly morals and reputation aren't enough. So we as a species have developed other types of pressure. And the first one, we develop laws, which in some ways formalize reputation. We've developed different security technologies. And those are the two other kinds of societal pressures. Third one I call institutional. And I, I use that word instead of laws because you might think of a, a criminal organization doesn't have formal laws, but they do have rules. And, and in some ways, laws are norms that have been codified, and then there are certain penalties that have been formalized. So we have laws against theft. And then we've delegated members of our society, police, to enforce those laws. So we've taken reputation and formalized it. It's interesting, we have, but we tend to focus on sanctions instead of rewards. If you think of reputation is both uh, rewards and, and penalties. But when you, when you get to a more formal system, you're mostly dealing in penalties. 
And I think it's, in, it's interesting. It's probably just because of cost. It tends to be much cheaper to penalize the few defectors than reward the honest. So you know, take stealing. A very, few, very small percentage of us are going to steal. So as a group, it's much cheaper for us to pay to, to sanction the few people who steal than to send all the honest people a, a check at the end of the year for being honest. Right? That just will get too expensive. There are exceptions. In the United States, there we'll see tax credits and tax breaks for certain bits of behavior. And that's an example of a reward. But generally, we, we, we deal in sanctions. A and the last type of societal pressure are security systems. Right? And these are the technologies of security. And they'll do things like induce cooperation or prevent defection or induce trust or compel compliance. And you can think of all the things you think of, right? I mean, door locks and burglar alarms, uh, guard systems, tall fences, uh, forensic and mitigation systems, recovery systems. I mean, all of those work. And some of those extend globally. Right, the security that's protecting my ATM card is a global security system. Right, it protects my ATM card in any country I use it, which is really kind of amazing when you think about it. And all of these work together. And I think that's important that, that you know, right, most of us, I guess, don't steal because we know it's wrong. Some of us don't steal because what would our friends think? The rest of us up here won't steal because we'll go to jail. And way up here are the people who just can't pick the door lock. And as security professional, I mean, people I deal with in work in security tend to only work up here. Whereas this is an entire array of pressures that are keeping people honest. And thinking more broadly, gives us a lot more to work with. So I mean, a great example is the eBay feedback mechanism. Which if you think about it, is a reputational security system. It only works on reputation. Now, if you cheat someone on eBay, they'll write you bad feedback. That's it. That's all it does. And for many years, it was the only thing that kept that market honest. And it works surprisingly well. Really, it's only in the last few years that it started breaking and more security was added. And that was, again, as, as scale got larger. But if you think about it, individuals are going to make some cooperate defect decision. I mean, they're going to make some trade off based on whatever criteria they have, whatever information they have. They're going to decide. You know, should I steal or should I not? And these pressures are a way society puts its finger on the scales. Right? It's how, how much we apply keeps the defectors down to some acceptable minimum. And the details are, you know, are very complex. It's not at all obvious in what works best in what instance. Right. Do they combine linearly? Do they have counterbalancing effects? I mean, lots of data point to this being extraordinarily complicated. But it's basically how things work. Right? Society will use these pressures to find some optimal balance between cooperating and defecting. And again, that doesn't mean zero defectors. Right? We know that too many defectors is too damaging. Right? Too many people sneak into this conference, the conference can't survive. But too few defectors is too expensive. Right? The security in this conference is pretty minimal. The conference could have spent three, four, five, ten times as much money on more security. And they would have reduced the number of defectors, but it wouldn't have been worth it. You go to a different conference, maybe a more expensive one, and there's more security. You go to the World Economic Forum, and there's a lot of security. You may, I'll go to other conferences, and there's, there's almost no security. Right? So this will all depend. It's very situational. 
So I think this way of looking at security has some real, explore, real strong explanatory power. And in, in my book, which some of you have, I used to talk about terrorism and the financial crisis of 2008 and organized crime and the internet. You know, a lot of different examples I, I pull to think about you know, using these notions of societal pressures. And I mean, there are a lot of directions to take this research. I really just sort of blew through a lot of things and did a lot of simplifications. And I'll sort of give you some of them. I'm talking about group interest versus self-interest, but in a lot of ways that's simplistic. We tend to be members of, of different groups, and often it's competing group interests. The interests of myself as a family member versus myself as a member of, of, of a city. Uh, myself as an employee of a company or myself in a greater community. Now you think of Edward Snowden, a sort of an interesting man. He was defecting from the NSA when he revealed secrets, but in his mind he was cooperating with society as a whole and as an employee of the NSA was defecting from society. And that's true for pretty much any whistleblower, that they're, they're living in, in, in different worlds. Uh, I, I talked about morals and reputation. There's actually some very complex interplay between the two because they evolve together. And, and you could argue that separating them doesn't make sense. Uh, I talked about institutional pressures in society. I made a gross simplification by, by calling laws codifications of societal norms. Right? If you know any history at all, you know very often that laws are not in the best interest of society. Right? And how that works is complicated. Uh, the, ex the effects of group decision making if you think about these, these trade-offs, often they're not made as individuals, they're made as groups. And that dynamic, I think, is real interesting and something worth exploring. And finally, how this plays out in common groups. So how this would play out in a corporate environment, right? in a group dedicated to profit-making, or in a government institution, or in an organization as a whole. I mean I, I, I mean, I could spend an hour on each one of those. I, each one is probably a chapter in the book. But, but you know, I, I kind of want to just mention them here. What I want to talk about, because this is much more of a technology conference, is how technology affects this. Because I think there's a lot of interesting thing there that, that we can learn from as technologists. So it, I think of technology, at least in this context, as something that allows society to scale. It's scale in some way. And in a lot of ways, technology helps things scale. Uh, more people, increase complexity, uh, de decrease distance, decrease time, increase intensity, and sort of all those dimensions. And you can think about those in relation to any system how technology helps the banking system scale, how it helps the making and keeping of friends scale, how it helps a conference like this scale. So if you think of these societal pressures as resulting in some balance between cooperators and defectors, a new technology which changes the scale of something upsets the balance. Right? Something becomes easier, cheaper, faster, better. And in response, society has to rebalance somehow. Right? So an example might be someone invents the gun and now murder is easier and you know, something has to happen in response. And that could be some new laws, that could be some new technology, that could be some new group norms. You know, we're seeing that on the internet with file sharing. Right, that the technology of the internet makes file sharing so much easier. And in response, we have two different responses, right? You have the response of the entertainment industry, which are to push for new laws and new technology to stop file sharing. And you have the response from many in society saying, well, hey, there's a new social norm here. That, that file sharing isn't bad, it's good. And what has to change is our conception of, of, of digital property and what it means. 
Right? We're in the middle of that, so it's hard to know where, where that shakes out. But you know, you can think of this as an iterative process, and, and society kind of rebalances and kind of keeps going on. And it basically works. So there's a problem with this. And, and that is that attackers have some natural advantage. That when you tend to get these changes, well, there's two things. One is a, a basic first mover advantage. The second is that attackers are in a better position to take advantage of new technologies. They, they're faster and more adept. And it's not just attackers. It's sort of anybody who's, who's marginal, who's uh, adaptive, right? who's not organized. And oh, well, that's a good example. Just imagine that someone invents the automobile. Right? And the police say, well, that's a really good idea. We should have one. And what? They have a study group to figure out whether they need an automobile. Then they have some request for proposals. And they get proposals. And they choose an automobile manufacturer. And then they procure a car. And then there's a whole training system. And they figure out how to use it. And meanwhile, the, the bank robber says, oh, look, new getaway vehicle. Right? It can make use of it much faster. And we saw this exact thing on the internet. Right? As in the mid-90s, when the internet appeared as a commercial entity, right? you suddenly could do business on the internet, that like overnight you had this new breed of cyber criminal that it was instantly able to take advantage of the internet to steal money. Meanwhile, the police, who were like trained on Agatha Christie novels, took what, about 10 years to figure out how to respond to internet crime. And now they're pretty good. I mean, the police have figured it out. But it did take them that 10 years. And that's what I think of, right? That delay is, is a security gap. That gap between when the uh, defectors can use a new technology and when the cooperators can. Now, it's not always true. I mean, there are certainly exceptions, like fingerprint technology. It doesn't really have a use for a defector. It has a strong use in, in fighting crime. But by and large, you do tend to see this gap with, the, with these neutral technologies. Right, it's just a result of the natural agility of the attackers. And if you think about it, the security gap is be greater in times of more technology and greater in times of rapid technological change. Actually, greater in times of rapid social change due to technological change. And if you think about it, we are living in a society with, one, more technology than ever before, and two, faster technologically based social change than ever before. So we're living in a world where the security gap is greater than ever before. <coughs> and it's really an open question whether we can ever get security right. Because technology is changing things so quickly that by the time we start rebalancing, we're unbalanced again. And it's going to be interesting to watch in the coming years whether this will work. And I think we're starting to see realizations of this. In the IT community, I see a lot more security based on this realization. It has different names, agile security, lean security, reactive security. I mean, it used to be in my industry, we would tell you all, buy this stuff and you'll be safe. Now we're finally saying, look, we know you're not safe. After you've been attacked, then come talk to us. Right? That realization that after the fact is often the best we can do. I mean, even the United States, the TSA, the airline security people are starting to, to realize that. That this notion of we can protect you is giving way to we need to be able to react quickly. If you think about it, that is exactly how the antivirus industry works. I mean, when antivirus started, there were two different competing uh, paradigms. One was the smart paradigm that would watch your computer for virus-like behavior and flag it. The other was the dumb paradigm that just checked for signatures of known viruses. 
The benefit of the smart paradigm is it detects unknown viruses. The problem with the smart paradigm is that it has a lot of false positives. Right? It detects a lot of things that aren't viruses, like installing any kind of Microsoft software, right, as a virus. And really what won is the dumb program. And, and if you have an antivirus program right now, it, it just mindlessly checks for, checks for signatures. It updates itself once a day or twice a day, depending on how you set it. Now, of course, any new virus will hit some of us before it's detected, before the signature's written. But the industry is fast enough that, by and large, this works. Or you think of it as similar to, I don't know, a herd of a quarter million gazelles wandering around the East African plains. It doesn't matter if there are a couple hundred lions circling the herd. The herd will do well. Right? The herd will survive because the lions will only do so much damage before the herd detects it and the herd defends itself. So that future implies that there always will be defectors, that technology will always favor defectors. But that's not entirely true, because there's another counterbalancing trend. And that is that the cooperators, the large institutions, being bigger, being more powerful, can use technology more efficiently. Right? So that's a good example. Right? So, so the criminals can use the internet to, to steal, but the government can use the internet to find thieves. That because this power exists, and, and the, the ultimate example would be NSA eavesdropping, to monitor everything, that technology can be used by the cooperators. And this also is, is uncharted territory, because this gets magnified with more technology and with larger institutions. And right now in our society, we have the most technology and the largest institutions. So when I look at the coming years, I see very much a battle between the large, I mean, actually another great example would be uh, uh, what happened in, in Syria. Right? The Syrian dissidents used Facebook to organize. The Syrian government used Facebook to arrest dissidents. Right? So that very much is the battle between the defectors, the agile, who can use these technologies quicker to subvert the system, and those controlling the system who can use these technologies much slower but more effectively to stop the defectors. Right, so it's very much uh, you know, David versus Goliath. And it's not obvious who wins. Certainly in the near term, who loses is the rest of us in the middle. Right, those of us who are not the big powers and also not the agile defectors. And those of us who are just want to use Facebook and be left alone. It becomes harder and harder. On the one hand, we know the NSA is eavesdropping everything we do. On the other hand, we have the cyber criminals trying ever new things to take advantage of us and steal our stuff. And so that's the balance. And I couldn't tell you how it's going to come out. I think it's, uh, it's very much an open question, something we're going to see. And, and it's not clear to me that there actually is a balance. All right, so I'm going to do a couple of final points, then I'm going to take questions. Uh, one, no matter how much societal pressure you deploy, there always will be defectors. You cannot get 100% cooperation. It is just simply too expensive. Two, we all defect at some times and in some things. No one is 100% cooperative. Right? We have evolved as individuals to have a mixed strategy. Sometimes we cooperate, sometimes we defect. Actually, most time we cooperate, sometimes we defect, for most of us. Uh, three, increasing societal pressure isn't always worth it. You very much get diminishing returns as you get more security. I mean, I'm, I'm making this up. Let's say there are 
our five people who snuck into this conference. If we double our security budget, we might have three people to get into the conference. We increase security budget by 10 times, maybe there's one person who sneaks in. You'll always get those diminishing returns. Four, there are good defectors and there are bad defectors and society can't always tell the difference. It can be very hard in the moment to know whether a defector is moral or not based on some abstract moral system. It's often history that decides. I mean, history will decide if Edward Snowden behaved morally or immorally. We all have opinions, at least most Americans do, but it will be history that will, that will issue the final verdict. And five, society needs defectors. We as a group benefit from the fact that some people do not follow group norms. This is where you get social change. This is where society evolves. Right? It's defectors who say, hey, we should free the slaves. Hey, we should give women the vote. Right? Or hey, you know, maybe minorities deserve equal rights. Right? That, those are defectors who say that first. And that's the talk. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>